Welcome to a Moron Science episode of The Modern Moron. Today, we try to go legit as we feature scientist Achintya Maduri, who has a PhD in electrical engineering. His work focused on solar panel grids that can be set up in areas where natural disasters have struck, which sort of turns into a discussion about basic economics. We also talk about growing up with scientist parents who also practiced religion, including reincarnation, which is one of the principles of Hinduism, as well as spirituality, levels of consciousness and faith, all of this from the perspective of a PhD and a moron. Thanks for listening. My guest is Achintya Maduri. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Have you ever had your your little bio read to you? Hmm, I don't think I have. Well, allow me to. (laughs) Achintya received a PhD in electrical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master of Science in Applied Ocean Science from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. His dissertation research explored the creation of a smart and scalable solar microgrid in order to efficiently electrify rural unelectrified regions. For the last three years, he has worked as a senior engineer at Amber Kinetics, Inc., a flywheel-based energy storage company in Union City, California, which I bet is pretty close to Silicon Valley. Achintya received his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Rice University. What do you think of that? Sounds like a pretty smart guy. (laughs) It also sounds like someone who didn't quite know what he was doing. (laughs) How many years of schooling are we looking at there? (laughs) Oh, man, sometimes I I don't want to count it up. But um, (laughs) so but if if we do, I think it's four for the undergrad, two for the master's and then another six on top of that. So we're looking at a clean 12 years. Clean 12 years of of college. And, and it's not like you're an old man or anything. So you pretty much spent your adult life in academia. Well, I mean, it's you make it sound much worse than it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you enjoyed it. I mean, one thing about college and universities, you're studying something you're passionate about. You're not taking a bunch of, uh, uh, what do they call them? <laughs> General ed requirements, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You do have to focus. Uh, um, you, don't, you don't get the opportunity to, uh, you know, explore every interest that you can have as as easily as you start you know getting further and further along the the sort of academic tract right or you would really can you imagine what your student loans would be if you did it'd be even <laughs> bigger than it already is your dissertation can you the creation of a smart and scalable solar microgrid how how micro are we talking what's your elevator pitch for your what your uh, dissertation was on. Sure. Yeah. It's funny because I actually uh, prepared more for the, for the company that I worked at afterwards, but, um, it's, it's good to talk about the, the PhD research too. The idea there was to look at a way that we could use modern advances in sort of the electronics, the, uh, the most recent solar panels and, and the, the surrounding technologies that connect solar panels to electric grids to come up with a with an architecture that could easily go in countries and regions where there was no infrastructure at all. Mm-hmm. So how can you strip the electric grid down to sort of the bare essentials? Like what is the bare minimum that's needed to have something that you can hook up some batteries, some solar panels, but then have it still connect a bunch of different houses that were using electricity at different times of the day that had different energy needs and also allow that system to scale up as these communities went from you know just having a few lights and some cell phones to then having refrigerators and televisions and then hopefully having some sort of small commercial machines that could really enable them to tap into their natural resources uh, more effectively. You describing that made me think think of the hurricane that hit, was it Haiti? Yep. Yeah. Or, or Puerto Rico. Exactly. That, that's what, that makes me think, wow, this would be something to take in, an, in a, how long would it take to set up in theory? How long would it take to build the infrastructure to start generating electricity? That part, like, I mean, if, if you just want to string up some lights it's something that can be done in a few hours, right? I mean, the hardest part, honestly, is probably digging the holes to lay the 
poles that carry the electricity from one place to another place. So for something like lights, especially these days, you, you might not even want to connect the different houses together. You could just give people solar lanterns or set up a little system that provides them panels, some batteries, and a few outlets so that their house can have electricity almost instantaneously. So, so it wouldn't be so much a grid in terms of supplying electricity to a town, each home would be self-sufficient in and of itself? Well, that would be the fastest way, um, right? If you if you right. just had some sort of an event where your, your local mm-hmm. grid has been completely knocked off and you're thinking, okay, how do I quickly get people some access to electricity? You could imagine that, um, and I'm sure this is what happens when a lot of the UN or whoever is stepping in to to set up essential services, they probably come with their generator, but you could also nowadays think of coming in with just a box that has a bunch of solar panels and batteries and and setting up these uh, generation and storage areas that provide electricity locally. Now, of course, there's some limitations when you just have these small um, systems, right? Because now you're sort of like, if, if you run out of the amount of electricity that you stored on your battery, there's no way for you to mm-hmm. get it from anyone else because you're disconnected. So you're all, I hear you. Yeah. Okay. So while each person is, you know, they've got their own supply, they're also out when they're out every they're out. Yeah. There's no way to uh Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. And is this uh economically feasible that there could be like kits in emergencies for hurricanes or something that they could distribute them that they could be relatively easily set up for households? Oh, I, I'm sure they are. I mean, I, you know, I don't speak from direct experience, but mm-hmm. um, I, I don't see any reason why that's that's not done more often. I, I mean, I think the challenge in all these uh, situations is just sort of the, the batteries. The batteries are sort of the hardest part of it because panels are pretty rugged and, and they're fairly cheap now, but batteries are heavy and they're a little bit harder to lug around. But I think if you think about, you know, going to a country that's just been affected by a natural disaster and you just need to have electricity fast, it's probably easier than having a diesel generator um, where you need to figure out a way to resupply that diesel every time it runs out. You know, if if your roads are blocked and that the logistics of getting diesel to those communities is itself a challenge, then solar panel and batteries sure seem a lot more effective. I I feel like I interrupted your your elevator pitch a little bit in terms of your PhD, strictly speaking, Mm -hmm. not uh, what what is what was your PhD dissertation? How would you I don't know if you could dumb it down enough for me personally. Um, but there's a challenge for you. Can you make it so so simple that even I could understand it? Sometimes I want to say, <laughs> tell tell me like I'm a second grader, but I don't want to offend second graders. So tell me like I'm a moron. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, you know, we, we kind of, we're almost there actually, because, you know, if we start with this notion that you each house has its own solar panel and batteries, mm-hmm. um, but then, you know, the problem, we've clearly identified it, if I use a little bit more today than I normally use, I suddenly run out of electricity. And if you, who are my neighbor, use a little bit less, you have excess that's, you know, that's not really used up because it's going to mm-hmm. get, your battery is going to get full to 100% tomorrow when the sun comes out again. So that's the whole idea. You know, how do you set up a grid so that we can share all our resources and and provide a way for the electricity, which really is just, you know, I think you, the way to think about think about it is is like water, right? Like imagine that we all have our water tanks and there's like, it rains every day and we have like an inverted umbrella that we collect water on our roofs. And we just want to f- find a way to share water between our houses and in such a way that everyone gets their fair share and then everyone who is buying pays and then everyone who's selling gets paid for it. Mm -hmm. So it's setting up that whole infrastructure and setting up a way for each house to almost automatically know what it's buying and selling and making sure that that's done seamlessly. Right. And that was sort of the idea. And so a lot of the work that I did went into sort of the protocols that are sort of like determining how this whole system works. Mm -hmm. Because each of these tanks, you know, because it's an electronic device, you can make them a little bit smarter than just this tank of water, right? So there's there's some way for them to talk to each other. There's some way for them to, you know, send little signals out. And what kind of um, communication? Each other. What kind of, how are they communicating? What are they telling each other? Yeah, so that was actually pretty neat. So it, the way that I set it all up um, was 
that they would just basically sense the voltage on the line. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's like, you know, if you have a battery, it starts out at some voltage, but then as it gets lower and lower, the voltage actually drops. I don't know if you've you've ever measured a a battery, like a, you know, a little. I haven't, but I, but I know generally what what you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So that itself is a signal, Mm -hmm. right? Because it's telling you, if you measure it, it's telling you how much how much oomph that battery has mm-hmm. left. And so the way that the system was set up, each of the homes on this grid can actually kind of sense the voltage that's on the grid. Mm-hmm. And that itself is the signal because that tells them, oh, I should, you know, there's there's a lot of power available. The voltage is high. That means that the sun is shining and I can fill up my mm-hmm. tank really easily. If the voltage drops below, that's a signal to them that, oh, you know, this means that there's a lot of demand and not enough supply. And if I have the ability to provide a little extra to the grid, this is a chance for me to do that and make some money. Let me ask you this. Following Mm -hmm. that that water tank analogy, I don't use all my water and I've got that water left. Right. And it'll be there tomorrow morning Mm -hmm. if if it's cloudy. And if it rains, I'll I'll be, I'll have even more. Right. Um, What about Bob down the road takes hour long showers every day. Sure. And he's using all his water every time. Is that built into your prototype for lack of a better word? Yeah. I mean, in a sense, like it's not addressing those challenges exactly, but kind of those are more economic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, those are economic right, 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 right. things that happen. Mm-hmm. But can you set up the system so that now, you know, what, what's going to end up happening is Bob, who's taking those long showers, it might become really expensive for him to keep buying from everyone else. And he might decide, you know what, rather than paying, you know, Stephen down the road an exorbitant price for me to take my hour long shower, maybe I can invest in my own water tank and make my solar panel a little bit bigger so that I can use more of the energy that I generate. So when he, when someone else uses more than their allotment from their grid and they pull from my grid, I make some money off of it and they get charged for it. Right. Something like that, or I get credit for it. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that that was kind of the, so, so that was sort of the, that's the sort of economic idea, but I was working more on on just the technical side of it. The economics were were underlying the the type of grid design. Right. This is more. Can it be done? Exactly. Can it be done from a technical yep. standpoint? Yep. Yeah. When you're having to explain this mm-hmm. to dummies like me, what is your biggest challenge in coming? Like the, the water analogy, I, I was able to wrap my pea brain around it pretty easily. <laughs> What was your biggest challenge in coming up with that? Uh, And what is your biggest challenge in communicating your concept to dummies like me? Well, you know, I I think it's probably just having this this notion of of electricity and, and, you know, voltage itself, like those those fundamental ideas Mm -hmm. um, are kind of hard to really understand. And I think you know, I don't think that's necessarily because people haven't studied enough physics. It's it's just something that is, you know, a little bit removed from, from our everyday life. Like we don't see voltages, we don't see currents. We we sort of have a vague vague idea of what they are, but you know, because we can't see them. That's so interesting you say that because how much we take electricity for granted. Mm-hmm. I mean, I flip a switch and I expect the lights to go on. I don't know how electricity works. Yeah. But I take it so for granted. Yeah. Until it's gone, like mm-hmm. like Haiti or you know any natural disaster. Right. When did you know, as a kid growing up, that that man that you were a science person instead of a I don't know a baseball? I'm into <laughs> sports, or I'm into science, or I'm into woodworking, or like when did you start to know? Hey, I'm kind of good at this. I you know I I think it just goes back to sort of like I remember always enjoying learning about sort of like how stuff works. I mean, the, the sort of cliche, but like I sort of remember. Did you take things apart when you were a kid? Yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed taking things mm-hmm. apart. Um, I, I really enjoyed. Do you remember taking something apart as a kid and your mom or dad finding it like, what, what did you, <laughs> did you ever get in trouble for like disassembling the TV or something like that? I, it wasn't anything quite that major, but I mean, I'd probably, <laughs> it was more things like old watches, um, you know, toys, wow. like stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. that it's a lot easier as a kid when it's mechanical, right? Like, because you can sort right. of be like, you, you know that there's some mechanism in there. And then when you take it apart and you can see that mechanism, you get that instant reward of seeing that. 
Mm-hmm. But even just, you know, looking at the sky and, and, and you know, wondering, like, what, what is it that makes the sun do what the sun does? Like, why is the sky blue? Like, you know, sort of the mm-hmm. whys of, of all these questions. And I still remember, like, having the big book of Tell Me Why and, like, wanting to keep reading different parts of it over and over again because it was just so much fun to, like, really think about it, especially when it was related to space uh-huh. and, and kind of let your imagination run a bit wild about like these other worlds like what's what would be like on venus or why is venus the way it is those kinds of questions were were always sort of the most fun parts of what i recall from you know what i learned as a child and uh, i think that was sort of a pretty early signal for me what kind of tv shows and movies were just were like that's it like, like what were you really into as a kid and a teenager before you, before you launched into this 12 year college <laughs> career <laughs> you know I, I think as a kid um this isn't exactly engineering but i think like I, the, the the tv show that i remember and it's weird because i grew up in india mm-hmm. and and the time when i grew up in india there were two channels they were both state run channels you got mm-hmm. The f- channel number one or channel number two and channel number one was always news channel number two had a little bit of variety between certain hours and there was this documentary series right and it's called wild america <laughs> and i've talked to all my american friends nobody has seen this i have I, I need to track down like when this was made and why you know growing up in the early 90s it was popular or it was aired in India. Wild in America. But that show was one of my favorite shows as a kid. I mean, it was not physics, but but still like nature show, but they took this really fun approach. Uh, and, and there was a sense of like exploration there that I think... So is it wildlife in America or all different types of natural science and other types of science in America? It was mostly wildlife, but I think that it also touched on, um, you know, yeah, it, it's also, it also, also touched on mm-hmm. like the geothermal oh, okay. side of Yellowstone and, 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 and those kinds of things. That show, <laughs> that's probably one of my favorite shows um, growing up. And I think that still left the, the biggest impression. I, every time I mentioned that show to someone, I'm like, I need to figure out when that show was made. I'm going to do some research on that. <laughs> this brings up another question that I wanted to talk to you. You grew up in India. Mm-hmm. And did you have any kind of regular church or religious upbringing that was like, we go to church or temple or whatever practices? Mm-hmm. Did you or your family uh, practice that? And how did your science maybe, was there ever a moment where your mom or dad went, listen, you're going to be a scientist, but uh, you're still going to practice religion, right? Or was there any, <laughs> what is your take on that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, so both my parents were also scientists. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. But they were, I mean, but our family was fairly religious. I wouldn't say that we were extremely like, I, I don't know where we'd fall on this scale, but I mm-hmm. think, you know. I would go to temple with my parents. We'd always have sort of the ceremonies on the on the on some of the holy days that mm-hmm. required any any type of religious ceremony. And and you know there were plenty of members in my family that were fairly religious. My grandmothers were both. Um, uh, for them, religion was a very important part of life. Can I ask what and, what religion it is? Yeah, yeah, we were Hindu. Hindu, oh, we are Hindu. Okay, so this is interesting. So it wasn't like you're the first scientist in the family, and you grew up with parents who were scientists and practiced religion. And so it naturally, for you and your upbringing, they naturally fit together. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that question, you know, changed as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think like I've talked to my mom about this and she went through phases too where she was more or less religious. And I think, you know, it depended on my phase of life is is how I put it. Like I'd, I'd say there were definitely periods during my adolescence where I had a lot of trouble thinking of even being religious. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say that there's part of that that's still there today. Considering that you're a science-based person naturally on a day-to-day basis. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Exactly. But, you know, I, I think um, at least the way that my parents practice Hinduism mm-hmm. and um, the way that I've always philosophically approached Hinduism, it's it's been less of an issue from from that perspective. I mean, I, I would say that we were possibly very selective or, or you could, you could argue either way, like either we were selective or the religion isn't as prescriptive. And 
there was enough of a sort of daylight between science and religion to where it never really felt like they were directly conflicting oh, really? with one another. I guess when we talk about religion, ultimately we're going to end up talking about faith. And if you talk about faith, right. sort of like electricity, it's like, I believe it's going to happen. I don't know how, right. but I know when I flip that switch, it's going to happen. And uh, does the Hindu religion believe in, in reincarnation? Yeah. Or no? Yeah. They I mean, do. Yeah, they do. But- from a scientific standpoint, can't really prove that, correct? No, or, I mean, right. you, you can't. Oh, um, no, you know what? I disagree with myself. You could say, and I've talked to my daughter about this, if I die and my body goes in the ocean, right. fish are going to eat it and I'm going to become part of the fish. And then another fish is going to eat that fish and I'll become part of that fish. And then that fish will get caught by a fisherman and I'll become part of the fisherman on and so on. So in a way you could literally say, yes, there is reincarnation right. from that standpoint. What do you, what's your take on that? And you know, a lot of that deals with this notion of the soul and you know, what, what, what happens to your soul after mm -hmm. you die and the core of what I took away from it. And, you know, I don't want to speak for all Hindus, because I found that every Hindu seems to have their own interpretation of what it means to be Hindu. Right. It's a personal experience. Um, but for me, it, it deals with this notion of, you know, the soul and what happens to your soul after you die. Now, of course, you could make the argument that, you know, that is, it, it's setting it up in such a very tricky way that there is no really scientific way to answer that question, because, you know, what is the soul? I mean, it's a philosophical construct. I mean, right. It's faith. It comes down right. to faith. How do you yeah. prove faith? Um, and maybe that's why it's, it's, it's sort of easier because in a sense, believing that a soul maybe has to go through a certain number of cycles and, you know, learn something mm -hmm. from each cycle sub, sort of subconsciously before achieving a state of salvation maybe doesn't have to do much with almost anything that's happening in the physical universe at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I didn't really, I, I would say that I never really had as much of an issue with that part of the religion. Mm -hmm. I think my frustrations always came more on sort of the ritualistic side of the religion, because that's where, you know, you sort of do a certain set of things, right? Right, like, right. Yeah. And, all religions and, have that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so that's where I, I found you know, more of my conflict. Do you for sort of like, why am I doing it? Why am I eating this bread? Why am I eating this fruit? Why am I burning incense? Yeah. That kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I guess my take on those rituals is that it's, it's a ritual and you do it over and over again to remind me of something. Yeah. You know, and, and that art could be fine, but I, I think it's sort of like the part where it's, where it's troublesome is when uh, it's a ritual that it depends on how partic how much you're participating in it, how much you are sort of a driver versus a passenger in the ritual, because mm -hmm. a lot of rituals, especially growing up, it's sort of, you go to a temple and then there's a priest that does a certain set of things. And then you mm -hmm. sort of just sit and experience it. Right. And um, that's sort of, that's difficult, right? Like, I mean, that's sort of, it gets into this whole notion of like your ego acting up because you're like, why am I made to sit here um, mm -hmm. and, and like see someone else do something like, what is it, what does it even mean to me now? Right. I think I haven't gotten over that yet, to be entirely honest. Like I still, that, that's probably why I'm less religious than mm -hmm. definitely my, my parents. And Have you had any of these types of discussions with your parents or or your grandmother. I mean, I could see it would be one discussion with your parents since they are both scientists. Was was your grandmother a scientist? No, she wasn't. Yeah. Have you had any kind of a discussion like this that she knows you're pursuing science and have you ever had any type of discussion with her like this? I don't know if I've ever had anything quite as directly. I mean, I think there is there's almost mm -hmm. a very sort of live and let live attitude that you know comes out of these rituals where you do it to a certain way because it's sort of like is this is the sort of currency that you pay for the social connection that you have and it's like okay i'll, I'll do this because it means that much to you and even though i don't believe mm -hmm. in this part of it i'll do it i can't say that i have had like a very deep conversation with with either of my grandmothers um i might have had a little bit more with with my mom's mother who passed away a few years ago because you know she and I would have a few more of these discussions and mm -hmm. I it, it felt like I was doing it more or less for her <laughs> rather than mm -hmm. any any other reason that I was doing but it. there's something to be said for that yeah you're doing being giving is a lot of what religion and spirituality yeah. is about yeah ironically yeah absolutely and you know I think that's probably like if I were to think about it that's probably 
the rational reason for doing it. It's because it was a way to connect with her and appreciate yeah. all the things that she gave to me. You do it out of respect. And, and maybe you come to, you know, with time comes a different perspective, which leads me to my, my thought that you feel like you're not as religious or as spiritual as your parents are. But I wonder if when your parents as scientists were your age, if they went through the exact same thing, because believe me, as you get older, you start leaning on that God concept right. Yeah, for no other reason than there's solace and comfort yeah. in that. So you may have a different, completely different outlook, and you may be just as spiritual and religious as your parents are when you become that age. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, possible. no, I, I, and I, and I think I've seen that too a, a little bit with them because a shift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I've had some of those conversations with my mother, and she told me that when she was in her early twenties, she kind of like she would like argue with her mother about, you know, why should I do this? What's the point? And you know, kind of go mm -hmm. at it um, with her in in a way to like debate the why she should be doing something. Um, and then now I, I, you know, she's sort of, it, the roles are flipped where I sort of kind of push back against her a little bit. And then she says, no, it's just the way it's done. And, you know, it's like, and she's mm -hmm. expressed that being more religious as she gets older has been something that gives her, yeah, I don't know if it's a sense of purpose or it, it just feels right, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. you, as you as you get to a certain stage, it just feels like that's what you should be spending more time on because it's giving you something that other parts of your life just can't. Yeah, I think also, you know, we go through this progression of thinking we can, I got the world by the tail. Right. And <laughs> right. with a little bit of living, you realize, oh, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> and I never did. And maybe yeah. I need to take a step back and there are things bigger than me. And I guess yeah. that challenge is greater in my perception for scientists that, are, you know, they approach the world, you know, they want to see facts and, mm -hmm. and uh, an mm -hmm. experiment that can be repeated with the same outcome. And mm -hmm. kind of have, that's what faith is all about, is about not knowing what the outcome of the experiment is. Yeah. So... Yeah, no, it's that's that's a good point. Wow, we got real deep, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. I, you know, I, I've come across you know both sets of scientists. I'd say you know the ones that are very adamantly opposed to the idea of religion because it's mm -hmm. fundamentally against the whole God concept. Yeah, I mean mm -hmm. everything. You know, a lot of it. Just, just as you're saying, this notion of faith, where you take mm -hmm. something without critically questioning mm -hmm. the idea, is is very against the notions of what it is that you do as a scientist. Where mm -hmm. you know any hypothesis that you have, you wouldn't accept as true uh, without running a set of experiments, or you know, without going through a, a a rigorous process to evaluate that hypothesis. And you certainly wouldn't, without testing a hypothesis decide that it's a law, right? And that's right. sort of what fundamentally religion is in many ways. What would you say with the scientists that you come in contact with? Do you find it's split 50-50? Most scientists are agnostic or atheist or, or what have you? Or is, right. there, is there a shift in that? Or do you notice any patterns in that? Or it's just it's probably true. Most scientists that I've come across with uh, come across tend to be agnostic. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're outright atheist. Uh, I think that's still fairly uncommon, which is maybe surprising. Um, but running across an atheist is, is uncommon in the world. In your yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I think most of them would would describe themselves as agnostic. Mm -hmm. That probably, in some ways, that's a more. <laughs> I, I would make the argument that's at least a more that stance is more in line with the scientific process because you know atheism sort of goes a little bit further. It, it sort of rejects the notion of any sort of god or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. and says that there isn't right and whereas agnostics where if you're agnostic you're sort of like well i, I don't really know i don't you know, know. is yeah. the best they can do is i don't know yeah i ask <laughs> i asked sydney this um uh -huh. have you ever heard of the show rick and morty i yeah i have i've seen one or two episodes okay so rick sanchez he's an completely immoral alcoholic right and yet yeah. he's a genius and he travels through all kinds of universes, the multiverse. Uh -huh. And there, he, in his opinion, there are an infinite number of possibilities in an infinite number of universes. Right. So unless you can prove that that's impossible to have a multiverse, which I don't think any can prove, one has yet been able to prove that there isn't. Right. That 
there is an infinite number of possibilities, then there must be a universe where there is a God, a universe where there's a God that's exactly of your understanding, one of my understanding, and even in a universe of both of our understandings, if there's an infinite number of possibilities. Do you know if that's been disproven? Like there, no, there's no way that there's a, a multiverse. No, I, I mean... I mean, we could theorize about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I think there's probably some basis for, for this notion of a multiverse. I'm sure that there's some sort of physicist who's who's done the the work to <laughs> lay, who's done the groundwork to lay out this theory <laughs> it's a lot of math <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but i mean i, I guess it, it kind of comes down to what what is it that that you mean by a god right like is is god just sort of like a being a a, a, a some sort of being conscious- right that has evolved to a Consciousness that created everything that is in the universe. Right. That, so that, that I had think the hammer that hit the thing that created the Big Bang. Right. Exactly. So that I think that is more challenging, right? Or that's sort of a, a stricter, <laughs> a stricter interpretation right. of what what a, what God is, because that sort of says that by that logic, then why would God be limited to a single multiverse? You know, because the multiverse, as I understand it, would also have been generated through the Big Bang, right? Like sort of like everything in the known universe started mm-hmm. in the Big Bang. And you know, we have the known universe and the unknown universe, because there's a lot of the universe that, you know, we can't observe. Mm-hmm. And right. that could include the multiverse. But that all started with the Big Bang. And so that means that if there is a God, why would God be restricted to a single multiverse? Wouldn't they be in all? Because just by that definition of being the the thing that the consciousness that started there would be multi well, multiverses or, or you know uh, yeah i guess my point is why would why would that be restricted to a single multiverse why would god be restricted to a single multiverse is the is maybe the question i would have i guess and if you pursue that question why would god create one multiverse and not just keep cranking them <laughs> When you talk about the unknown universe, maybe those multiverses exist in the unknown universe because as far as we look out into the cosmos, we still can't see everything, right? Right. Well, I guess um, that's true. But I think what I was trying to get at was why would it be the case that if there is a God, I guess I don't understand why they would be restricted to a single multiverse. Like the the multiverse Mm -hmm. restriction should only apply to us, not to to God. Not to God if the definition... If we agree that... God is a conscious being. Creator. Right. right. And, and, and a creator. A creator. Yeah, that, that's, that's important. Yes. Because I think a lot yeah. of religions, uh, which I think of Native American, and <laughs> if you want to go to Star Wars, <laughs> Yoda, I, mean, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think that's where George Lucas got the concept of the force, is that I believe Native Americans believe that God exists in all the trees and the rocks and the animals and all things. Right. That that is God, which then you would probably say that that is not a consciousness. Or maybe Mm -hmm. there's a different definition of what consciousness is that you and I don't know about. Yeah. Yeah, And, and, you know, that I think that is very similar to how I've been or how I think of Hindu philosophy as well, Mm -hmm. where there is something in all beings Mm -hmm. and i think i don't even know if i would restrict it to living things like it could be in everything Mm -hmm. um so so that is very that tracks very well with this with this the the notion of the force it's just this this energy that is an energy in everything yeah Mm -hmm. right like it's it's an energy that's in everything and it is part of this being uh if if you could define it as that which is God and the question of whether or not it is conscious kind of gets tricky because our understanding of consciousness right. is yes so limited to our our, our experience yeah our experience I mean we have trouble sort of ascribing consciousness to other animals mm-hmm. right I mean I think that that's because of our own limitations in in how we perceive the world and how our consciousness is a function of our specific biology that's maybe a whole different discussion is what is consciousness and what is what consciousness is to me right. and to you is different <laughs> than what it is to you yeah and what it is to a shaman than what it is to my dog you know right 
So maybe right. that's a whole, yeah. okay, my brain is full. Yeah, but I mean, you know, that sort of the Star Wars version of religion <laughs> has always been one that I think, you know, tracks pretty closely with my own. You really? really? <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's in a way, it's both inoffensive yet very deeply comforting. So <laughs> yeah, I, and that's kind of what made George Lucas kind of a genius that he did his homework and, right. and found this, this religion that he created for the movie that I think a lot of religions can relate to. Right. Right. Wow. Um, is, is there, <laughs> so to, to head towards the barn, as they say in America, yeah. um, is there a question yeah. that I didn't ask you that you kind of wanted to talk about? Anything that I, that I missed? Hmm. Well, uh, actually, you know, I was thinking when, when you, you know, sug- you asked this question about um, church and, and, and religion and mm-hmm. science, um, you know, something I was thinking about, was just, I feel like there's always this notion that, you know, morality is one of those things that you learn because of religion, mm-hmm. right? Like right. as, as which, and I, and I think, you know, that's something that I, I've always felt was very sort of maybe unfair to people who are maybe not religious, but also, how, how do you mean, unfair? you know, very lit, Unfair to someone who's not well, religious. Because, I'm curious. About that. Right. Because I think, you know, it's sort of by implication, if you learn morality through religion mm-hmm. and morality is about treating other people in a way that is um, right, you know, uh, that is moral, that is mm-hmm. good, quote unquote, um, then if you don't grow up religious, then you wouldn't know how to do then- that. You're saying, right, so if like I grew a, up without religion, I might not have morals? Well, that's, that's if, you, if you say that morality is, you know, why is religion important, mm-hmm. right? Like, I think I was, I was kind of thinking about it that way. It's mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, I, why is religion important? Is it, is it important because it gives me an explanation of how the world works? Uh, eh, maybe, but I mean, that's, I feel like I, I would rather have, the scientific version of why the world right. works. Is it is it important because it teaches me how to behave towards someone else? I'm not even sure that that's necessarily true because I, you know a lot of it is still I think something that it, it, it's more from our social society that we learn how to you know treat each other right. And there are societies of different religions that have treated each other right. There are societies that have very little religion that have treated mm-hmm. each other right. And it's not clear that religion is, is, is that part. But then there is also this sort of philosophy, right? And I think that's maybe what you were getting at, which is what, what, how do I make sense of the world? Like my personal sense of the world and, how, and why, my place in it and how do I understand sort of like the things that are not in my control and the things that I can't see and the things that I can't explain. And I feel like that sort of that void, which is maybe very, I mean, which is very substantial. That's sort of where I would, I I think religion um, is important. And that's sort of the void that I think of as religion. And and it seems like um, something that's important to you for religion, because I've heard you mention it a couple of times is the philosophical aspect or the philosophical view of a religion. I, I, done a, I went to a Catholic high school, but I'm not Catholic. And I've kind of mm-hmm. studied and attended uh-huh. services uh, uh, for Buddhism. And I feel like for me, mm-hmm. Buddhism resonates a little more for me than Christianity for me, um, because mm-hmm. I feel like it mm-hmm. has more of a philosophical approach, or if, if I'm wrong with that, mm-hmm. that the philosophy of Buddhism sort of lines up and makes it makes a little more sense to me and it resonates with me and i think it it seems like that's what right hinduism does for you in terms of the philosophy of that religion and i think everybody needs that philosophy to sort of ground them a little bit right right yeah no and i think think what you said also just now uh that there's this expanse you know the known world and you want science to explain how the world works but there's this other part that you don't know how, how it works for all the science that you know. So, you know, and we'll continue to know and and you'll continue to grow in your profession and, and, and studying science and reading about science. There's still that, there'll still always be that gap for lack of a better word. 
that will be unexplained and maybe right. practicing religion and the, the rituals that go with it mm-hmm. will give you a little solace in not worrying about what that <laughs> yeah. thing is that I don't know. And that, yeah. I guess that that's the word faith. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to sleep good tonight, I think. <laughs> we solved it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's pretty deep stuff, whether you're a scientist or a moron, right? Many thanks to Dr. Achintia Maduri for taking time to speak to The Modern Moron, and thank you as well for listening. We'll see you next time. 